When it comes to using interactive notebooks in Python, for many years Jupyter has been the main technology in that space. And you can use Jupyter Notebooks for exploring data, for analysing the output of code, and for generating visualisations and many more. Now there are some pitfalls with Jupyter that we're going to discuss later on, and there's a new kid on the block, so to speak, and that's Marimo. And I want to dive right in and explore what Marimo is and what it does in this video. We're going to see how to set it up and how we can use it in our Python workflows. So before we dive in, if you want to support the channel, we have this coffee page. There's a link in the description. And don't forget to subscribe if you're enjoying this content. So let's get started with Marimo. If we scroll down here on the documentation, which is linked below the video, we have different ways of installing it. For example, with pip or using UV or conda. I'm going to use UV in this video because I've been using it a lot lately. And I'm on Windows, so I'm going to load up PowerShell here. And we're in a directory that contains a single CSV file that we're going to use in our Marimo notebooks later in the video. So let's use UV here. I'm going to create a virtual environment with the UV venv command. And you can see if we ls the directory, we now have the .venv directory. And that's the standard when you run the UV venv command. If you want to know more about UV, check out the video we did on that topic recently. We can then activate the virtual environment. And we're going to use the UV pip install command and we're going to install Marimo into this virtual environment. Now that collects all the packages that are dependencies of Marimo and it installs them all. And as you can see, that was pretty quick for all of these packages. UV speed is one of its main advantages. And once we've installed that, we can run the UV run command and we're going to run Marimo tutorial intro. And this is a notebook that's provided by Marimo. And you can use that notebook to get started and learn about the notebooks and learn about how to use them. So when you run that, you get this URL and it's going to automatically open that in the browser. I'm going to go to the notebook now. And here we have this introduction to Marimo. And as you can see, you can have these cells here and you can import Python modules and run code. And you can see the output of that. As you can see here, we're using the mo.md function and that outputs some markdown in the text above here. And we can also create things like sliders that we can then use here. And it's all very interactive. Notice the comment here, Marimo is a reactive Python notebook. And that means that unlike traditional notebooks like Jupyter, Marimo notebooks are going to run automatically when you modify them or when you interact with UI elements like the slider. So that's one of the big advantages here. If we modify this slider, you can see the output is interactively updating. We don't need to rerun the cell or anything like that. So that's one of the really nice things here about this Marimo notebook environment. Interacting with these UI elements like sliders is automatically going to trigger the notebook execution. And if we scroll down, we can see some other things in action. So the notebook is made up of small blocks of Python code called cells, very similar to other notebooks. And let's see what else we have if we scroll down here. We have these UI elements that are part of the Marimo package. For example, we can create a dropdown using the dropdown function and also a slider. And you can see these here and these are going to update, as you can see below, whenever the UI element is changed. So if we change that to a different icon, you can see that it all is going to update without us having to re-execute the cells. This is one of the important points. Marimo is just Python. So Marimo cells parse Python and Marimo notebooks are stored as pure Python files and outputs are not included. So there's no magical syntax like there is with Jupyter. If you create a notebook and you save that, it's going to be a .py file. It's not going to have some special extension and special syntax. And that means that it's easily versioned with Git. It's legible for humans and machines and it's formatable using code tools such as Black, Isort and Rough. And importantly, it's usable as Python scripts and UI elements take the default values. And notebooks are also runnable as apps. So if we click this window icon at the bottom right here, we're going to toggle the app view. Once we're in that, you can see that we have a different output here. We don't have the cells where we can edit the code. This is an app view of the notebook. We also have a command line tool and we can use commands like Marimo edit and Marimo run in order to run notebooks and create and update notebooks. And we can also convert traditional Jupyter Notebooks to Marimo Notebooks using the Marimo convert command. So you just provide the Jupyter Notebook as the parameter and you redirect the output to a .py file that represents your Marimo Notebook. Now Marimo comes packaged with a variety of tutorials. You can look at these if you want. And to start a tutorial, you just run the Marimo tutorial command as we did a second ago. And then you pass whichever tutorial you actually want to run. And finally, if we go to the very bottom here, we've got a fun fact. Marimo is a reference to a type of algae that, under the right conditions, clumps together to form a small sphere called a Marimo moss ball. So that's awesome to know, and you can take that forward into your everyday life. Let's now see how to create our own notebook. So we're going to go back to the command line here. I'm going to stop the server, and we're going to run that Marimo edit command. 
and we can provide a name for the notebook. So I'm going to call it testapp.py. Remember, these are .py files. And that's going to create this new notebook and it's going to open it in the browser. So we now have this new notebook opened. And what we're going to do is use polars in this video. And we're going to just do some basic analysis of that CSV file. And we'll show that file in a second. So let's start by trying to import polars. And that's not going to be available by default because when we created the environment with UV, we didn't install anything except Marimo and its dependencies. So when we execute this cell here, you can see that we've got a notification that we have missing packages and we handily get the option to install this using pip or using UV. So I'm going to select UV here and we're going to install Polars into this environment. As you can see, it's now installing that. And this is another benefit of Marimo over the traditional Jupyter Notebook. If something's not installed, we can very easily install it and we have this nice UI for doing so. After that's done, we can now import Polars as PL. And just to make sure it is installed, if we go to the left hand side, there's a lot of useful options on this sidebar. One of them is Manage Packages. When we click that, we can see all of the packages that are installed in this environment, including now Polars. And of course, we also have Marimo and all its dependencies. So let's close the Manage Packages tab. That's very useful to visually see what's installed in this environment when you're running the code. Now I have a CSV file that I want to load in here and if we go to the icon at the top left of that sidebar you can see here what we have in the current directory languages.csv and if we open that you can see this data that we have in that file. So the data has a date and this is monthly data on programming languages and each column represents a programming language for example Ada and this is essentially charting the popularity of programming languages since the year 2004. So let's read this file in and I'm going to do that in the top cell here. We're going to create a data frame by calling polars.readcsv and I'm going to pass a couple of arguments to that. So first one is the file name and that's languages.csv and we're going to pass infer schema length and set that to 1000. And then we can look at the data frame.head by using that function and you can see the data here. Now if we look at the data you can see this is a data frame in polars and each row has the date and that's a given month and then we have all of these programming languages and that's the percentage popularity in this survey. So for the month July 2004, out of 100%, ADA had 0.36 popularity in this survey. And you can see that C and C++ had about 10%. Now just to make sure that each row sums to 100% or roughly so, what we're going to do is we're going to add a new Python cell. And you can see you can add Python, Markdown, SQL, and also there's a Generate with AI tab as well. What I'm going to do is look at the very first row, and that's for July 2004 in this data. And what we can do in that row is we can take this column here, which represents the languages, and we're going to ignore the first column, which is the date column. So the second column has this programming language, which I've never heard of before. I'm going to add that in here. It's called ABAP. And we're going to take all the columns from that column to the end of the row. So if we look at that, it's just going to give us all of the columns in the data frame, except that date column. And then we can sum up these horizontally across the X axis. So to do that, we can call another function here, and that's the sum horizontal function. And notice that completion that was available there in the Marimo notebook. When we execute that, you can see we basically get 100%. Now we can also view the data sources that are coming into this notebook. There's an explore data sources tab at the top left. So we can see the data sources here and we can see all of the columns. That can be very handy when you have this exploratory data analysis. Now let's add a new cell here and that's going to be a Python cell. I'm going to paste some code in here to get the data for November 2016. Now how do we do that? We take the data frame and we call dot filter and we're filtering down those rows to only the ones where the date column contains that date. And then we're selecting all of the columns except for the date column. So if we print this out, we're going to see that we have all the programming languages from the first one here right up to Visual Basic. And we have the popularity scores for each of them. Now let's try and find the three most popular of these languages. So what we're going to do is we're going to take that November 2016 data and convert it to a dictionary here. And if we look at that dictionary, we can see what we get back here. So each programming language is represented as a key and then the value is a single element list in Python. So we can explore the data using the Marimo notebooks very easily and we can see what we've got. And then we can perform additional changes to that data. For example, what I want to do here is get back this in a flatter format. So we want the programming language alongside the numerical value. We don't want that list. So to do that, I'm going to create a dictionary comprehension here. So we're going to get a dictionary called values. And we're going to loop over each key and value. And what we're going to do is just return the key and the value. We're just going to extract that first element from the list. So then if we look at values here, we're going to have a more flat representation of that data, as you can see above. 
And the final thing I want to do here is sort this so that the most popular language is at the top and the least popular is at the bottom. So in order to do that, what we can do is use the sorted function in Python. So let's call sorted here and we're going to pass values.items in to be sorted. And the key for sorting is going to be the value, which is the number. And of course, we pass reverse equals true to get the most popular at the top. And you can see that in November 2016, the most popular programming language was Java, second was Python, third was PHP, and so on. Now what we can do is we can plot the rise of Python. So when this data started in 2004, Python wasn't the most popular language by any means, but it has risen greatly over the years. And we can plot that out using a chart because these Marimo notebooks, they support visualizations. So let's see how we can do that just now. We're going to add a new Python cell. And what we can do is take the data frame and we can get the Python column. And that's going to give us back all the values for Python. And you can see at the beginning, Python's popularity was around 2.5%. By the end of this data, it was 29%, which represents a significant chunk of the popularity. So what we can do with the Python data is we can call dot plot, or rather we access the plotting interface on the Polar's data frames. We do that through the plot property, and then we can call the dot line in order to draw a line function with Python. Now notice again, we're getting this error here. We require a version of Altair that's greater than 5.4. So what I'm going to do is go to the Manage Packages section on the left. And at the top here, we can install a package directly through this interface. So if I type in Altair here and we click Add, that's then going to install that package. And you can see we've got version 5.5 now available in the notebook. And now we can rerun this command here. And you can see we get this line chart. So this is the rise of Python from around 2.5% back in 2004 up to its current value of around 29% in terms of popularity. We can ignore the x-axis here, it's just the index of the data. If we were plotting this properly, we might want to do some date time ticks at the bottom there. And we can also set some styling on this. For example, after we call dot line, we can call functions such as mark line. Mm -hmm. And these are Altair functions, and Altair is a plotting package in Python. And we can set the color here, for example, to blue. And what I'm going to do is copy this line of code down below, and we can compare Python to another language. For example, let's look at Java. And we're going to make the color of that orange, let's say. Now, in order to add these to the same plot, we're going to store the resulting figure in a variable. So we're going to create one for Python and one for Java. And then we can add them together here in order to generate them on the same plot. So Python plus Java. And you can see what we get back here. So it's kind of the opposite trend in a way. Python started out at a very small percentage. And you can see it's greatly risen in popularity. Whereas Java started out with a huge share of the popularity, around 30% in 2004. And that has been trailing off to what it is now, which is around 15%. Not too bad, but it's nowhere near what it was in 2004. I'm going to add one more language to this, and that's PHP. And then we can add that to the chart. And when we plot this, you can see what we get back for PHP. Similar to Java in the trend, as you can see here. It didn't start out with the same level of popularity, and that's been tailing off a bit as well to around 5% in 2024. Now, if you're interested in this data, it's available on Kaggle at this link that I'll leave below the video. I don't know how valid this data is. To be honest, I'm quite surprised that PHP has such a low share. When you consider things like WordPress and all those tools, as well as Laravel, which is an excellent framework, I think PHP maybe is slightly more popular than this but that's the value I've got from this data. Now, I just want to finish this video by showing some other Marimo Notebook examples. Obviously, this isn't a production level chart. You would add x-axis, legends, and so on. But this is a quick video just to show that you can generate these visualizations using tools like Altair and tools like Polars. So I'm gonna add a cell right at the bottom here, and I'm gonna paste some code in. So we can import Marimo as MO, and we can create things like progress bars. So in this example here, we're importing time from the Python standard library. And we've got a for loop here, and we're calling mo.status.progressbar. That's a function, and we pass a range of 10 into that. So it's going to iterate 10 times, and in between each iteration, we're going to sleep for half a second, and we're going to print i to the terminal. Now you can see what's happening here. The progress bar is in progress, and every half a second, it's going to progress to the next stage. And that allows you to create these kind of cool progress bars as part of the Marimo notebook. I don't think we actually need this print statement here, so I'm just going to get rid of that. But that's the cool interactivity that's demonstrated here. And of course, instead of sleeping just for half a second, we can also introduce some randomness. So let's import the random module. And when we call time.sleep here, I'm going to replace that. And instead of just sleeping for half a second, we're going to sleep for a value between 0.01 and 2. 
and that's going to use the random.uniform function. And you can see now the status bar as it progresses, there's a slight change in the timing sometimes. Sometimes it's very quick, sometimes it's slower, and that is going to be randomly distributed between 0 0.01 and 2 seconds. So you can see how nice the interface is here for Marimo and how easy it is to use these widgets as well as how to plot data and analyze data. Now before we finish, I want to highlight a couple of extras. One is using SQL. So Marimo lets you mix and match Python and SQL. So you can use SQL to query Python data frames or indeed databases like SQLite and Postgres. And then you can get the result back as a data frame. Now in order to do this, you can install the additional dependencies. For example, here is the pip command. And as well as just installing Marimo, you specify the extras for SQL, and it's going to be the same with UV. And what that allows you to do, if we scroll down here, is we can create pandas data frames, and then we can actually query that data frame as an SQL statement. So I'll leave a link to this page, and you can explore more on this. We also have AI auto-completion. So Marimo comes with GitHub Copilot, and that's a tool that helps you write code faster by making these suggestions of inline code. And you can integrate that by following the instructions on this page. If we go back to the notebook and go to the top right, we have a settings bar. At the bottom of that, we've got the user settings. If we click that and go to the AI tab here, you can add the keys for whatever services you want to use for AI. For example, OpenAI, Anthropic, and also Google AI. Now we could explore this functionality in a future video. If you're interested in that, leave a comment below the video. And we can close this off now. So I just want to finish by summarising what I like more about Marimo compared to Jupyter Notebooks. First of all, Marimo Notebooks are very reactive. So when you change a variable in one cell, it's going to cause all the cells that use that variable to rerun. And that's very convenient. It's a big advantage over Jupyter Notebooks in my opinion. We also have the file format. So what I'm going to do is go back here and stop the server. And if we ls this directory, you can see we have the notebook here. And that's just a .py file, it's a normal Python file that you can then put on GitHub and you can share it with other people. So there's nothing like the IPy notebook format that you have with Jupyter and that's a custom format with custom syntax. This is just Python and that comes with many advantages. I think the SQL and AI features that we touched upon at the end there, they're big advantages as well, something that makes it just a nicer environment to work in as a developer or as a data scientist. And finally, that ease of installing dependencies, as we did at the start of the video, for example, when we imported Polars, it wasn't available, but we could easily install that through the interactive environment. And we have that easy visual way to look at dependencies on that left-hand sidebar with the Explore Dependencies tab. So that's going to be all for this introduction to Marimo. If you're interested in more, let me know in the comments. There's a lot of topics we could cover. This has just been a basic overview, and we saw the rise of Python as a programming language. And we also saw the fall of Java from 30 to 15%, something I'm sure most Python developers are quite happy about. If you're interested in any of these follow-ups, let me know in the comments. And if you want to support the channel, we have that coffee page linked in the description. And finally, if you've enjoyed the video, give it a thumbs up, and we'll see you in the next video.